In a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them, these brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, Chad Robinson, Destin Melbarnes, Nathan Lutz, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome all you lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable, where we watch movies and then talk about them. I'm your host, Brian Fry, and joining me today is our good friend, Dustin, and a very, very, very special guest, uh, past uh, past boss of mine, in fact, John Belusic. How are you doing today, John? Hey, I'm good. How are you guys? And Dustin, how are things in sunny Texas right now? Uh, sunny. Uh, now, not as we had a freeze, not as bad as last year's freeze that made national news, but it's nice and sunny and pleasant. People can feel good about a seventy degree February day. Excellent, excellent. Uh, it's uh, I think it's like forty degrees and raining here, but that's been better than the eight degrees and bitter that it's been yeah. for the last week. So uh, let's do a couple warm up questions here, guys. In this movie, it's a dangerous time quote unquote for rock and roll what is your favorite era of rock and roll music dustin i uh, had to think about this a little bit i'm going to go with uh, alt rock from 08 to 2015 uh the bands that kind of fit this er like era for me it would be what i consider my favorite band silver sun pickups uh phantom muse uh, queens of the stone age uh, foo fighters released some stuff in that time if I were to go earlier than 08, I would probably include like Smashing Pumpkins and Weezer into that like space. Um, but I think that's my favorite time, maybe because I was like, you know, affording to go to like concerts. I, I was affording to be able to go and do this stuff on my own. Um, you know, I like classic rock. I like a glam, but I'd say that period's perfect for me. Excellent, excellent. John, I know you'll eat this question up too. So same question for you. Yeah, gee, it's so hard to pick just one. <laughs> right. Uh but I, I have to I have to go probably with like the prog era, you know, um early yeah. early to mid seventies into the eighties. Um I mean the prog bands when I was a teenager, like Yes and Genesis, they were having such huge hits on the radio. Uh sure. even if they weren't radio hits, they were having huge hits on like the rock stations of the time. Uh, King Crimson, um those are, those are probably the top ones that come to mind. But I can totally relate to the music in these and the movie because I love that there were like three yes songs in the movie. I mean, the movie has so much music in it that they just kind of they just kind of they just yeah. sneak little tidbits in there. You don't even realize the songs are there. Absolutely. Uh, I was a '90s kid, so uh, grunge was definitely my wheelhouse. I've I've enjoyed so many different eras of music, and, and I think that's the one one of the wonderful things about music. And then this movie too is this movie really does celebrate the music. Like it's got a lot of drama in and around it, but it's it's celebrating the the, the art. I, every time I listen to something new, and I'm like, wow, that's really good too. It just it just adds to the adds to the power of it. So today uh, we are going to be doing 2000s Almost Famous. This uh, movie is starring Patrick Fugit, Billy uh, Kudrup, Francis McDormand, Kate Hudson, Jason Lee, Zoe Deschanel, and Philip Seymour Hoffman. It was released in 2000. It grossed about $32.5 million, uh, placed 80th in the box office that year, with Proof of Life ahead and The Legend of Bagger Vance behind it, which is also one of my very favorite movies. Uh, the number one movie that year was How the Grinch Stole Christmas. It came in at just about an 8 in its IMDb rating, 7.9. Critics' tomato meter gave it an 89, audience at 92, so this is a much, much loved movie. It got one Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay and three nods, uh, Best Actress in a Supporting Role, Kate Hudson, Best Actress in a Supporting Role, Frances McDormand, and Best Film Editing. Uh, it uh, took away two Golden Globes, one for Best Film and one for Best Actor in a Supporting Role, again for Kate Hudson, and two nominees, uh, Best Original Screenplay and Best Actress in a Supporting Role, fa uh, Frances McDormand. Two BAFTA Awards and four nods for that as well. So uh, almost famous, guys. Uh, Dustin, had you seen it before? 
Not really. That's my official answer. Uh, I'd seen the scenes before, like it'd been on at a buddy's place. Um, I, th- I think, uh, and I, we're in the part of the podcast where we're not spoiling anything yet. So I had definitely seen the scene where one band member jumps off something high. I can't really say much more than that. But but uh, th- see, here's the thing. This this kind of movie about like glorifying music never really interested me so i I didn't really pursue it at all uh so so i i got my first viewing especially like with a critical eye uh for this podcast just five days ago oh this is this has got my rapt attention i can't wait to to get your take on it yeah uh, john tell me about your background with it but well, gee i don't know i think i was a good decade uh where i didn't consume any media it seems because i never saw this movie until uh a few weeks ago uh, oh, I was yeah. well aware of it. I mean, it was very, it wasn't uh, a huge hit when it came out, but for some reason I definitely was aware of it when it first came out, kind of always had my attention because of the topic. Um, you know, the trailer looks great. It's a great trailer. Uh, yeah, I checked it out for the first time a few weeks ago, but I have seen it a couple times since. This, uh, this movie hit me at right about the, the time that, you know, Patrick Fugit's character, William Miller, uh, it's, you know, his age range, uh, in 2000, I was 16. So it was, it was definitely something where you're like, man, that would be awesome. Like this, this, this was something to aspire toward, uh, to a, gr- a degree, especially if you also enjoy writing. I, uh, yeah, I had seen this before. I had put it away for a long time and I don't really think that that was on purpose. I just simply hadn't watched it in a while. So when it came up on our, uh, discussion for what this movie should be, I was like, well, yeah, that, <laughs> so it was great coming back to it again did you have any expectations for it dustin yeah and they were off they were wrong you look at the movie poster or you look at um sort of media release stuff and it's it's all sort of centered around kate hudson's face so you kind of assume <laughs> at least i did that this is it is a lovely face it's it's a great face <laughs> nothing wrong with that but yeah, it, it definitely like seemed like oh, this is going to be driven by her character, and uh, I was refreshed when my expectations were changed into oh, what are we actually following here? Ooh, this is way more fun than I expected. Uh, should like should this actually have been following you know Penny Lane and the Band Aids? I think I would have enjoyed it far less. So I, I was very surprised, like pleasantly surprised that like oh, this is this is cool what we're following here. John, did you have any uh, preconceived notions, and were they uh, uh, correct, or were you surprised? Uh, well, you know, I, I'd seen some things about it. There's a few uh, I, few podcasts that have discussed the movie quite in depthly, um, with the anniversary being a couple years ago, mm. 20th anniversary. So uh, some things had popped up on my radar that kind of piqued my interest. I guess when you know Cameron Crowe directing it, I haven't seen a ton of his movies. Uh, you know, I, I, I have seen singles and um, uh, say anything, of course. I saw that back in the late sure. 80s. But his reputation, you know, is definitely precedes him. And I, I saw so my expectation primarily was for a quality film. I didn't know a lot about the storyline, but in a weird way, I kind of felt like I did. Like when I watched it, it wasn't so much of a rev- revelation, maybe just because it's been out there for so long. I knew more about it. I absorbed more about the story than I than I knew, uh, even without seeing it. So, no, I really was going into it with an open mind. I definitely felt like it was going to be a, a huge coming of age tale, and I think it definitely delivers on that. And I was expecting great music. I heard a lot about the prep and and production that went into the music scenes. So I had high expectations there, and I think it delivered pretty pretty strongly in both areas. Uh, did you guys watch the standard or the bootleg cut? Standard. I, I I almost went for bootleg, but um, it, it it helps my overall picture of the picture if I can get this wrapped up tightly. You're gonna add an extra thirty minutes in. I'm I'm gonna be in an ornery mood, like a alligator with no toothbrush. So I uh, I, I went with the standard, not the uh, bootleg. Yeah, I, I watched the standard uh, version. I, I did hear there was a. Are you talking about the director's cut? Is that the, is that a? Is it, it's it the yeah it, or? yeah they call it. I think it's forty forty two and a half minutes. Jeez, a Lou. Yeah. Um, so it's so a I went, movie as it is. Yeah. <laughs> I I, uh, well, I own it, so I, I went I went full 
full steam ahead. So if I do bring up something in our conversations that, that isn't in the standard, cause I don't have them memorized in that way, uh, just chime in. Cause I'm actually curious, you know, exactly. It's kind of something I wish there was an option on a lot of DVDs or digital copies where you could say, Hey, can a little light just blink in the corner when this is additional content? And not because, you know, I don't, I don't have it carbon copied, memorized enough to be like, oh yeah, this is all extra take. Well, I think that that lends to uh, John and I find that something was potentially lacking that you can step in and you know, well, okay, check this out. This is actually what should have been done. I, I will say, uh, audience, if if you're uh, listening to the the Drunken Master podcast, what Russell and I, Chad Russell and I came to our conclusion with uh, The Legend of Drunken Master was that there's definitely objectively a best dub and a worst dub. And we <laughs> learned that Russell watched the bad version. Uh, and so and, and it actually affected how much he enjoyed the movie. Um, and it should have because like, there was objectively something better. Now, 42 additional minutes of content, that's that could be incredible. Um, but I, I do like the idea that you know we did watch something different in a way. So with the with that uh, version, do you see the full Stairway to Heaven uh, scene? I don't with Francis don't, with Francis th- McDormand. I, I heard there was a scene with Francis McDormand where I guess the kids force her to listen to Stairway to Heaven and they try to explain it to her. I, I actually have a little bit of insight here, but go ahead. All right, uh, I no, I remember I remember that that speaking piece, but I don't remember them playing the full song in the film. There's a very particular reason for this, and I don't think that since it's kind of theoretical in nature, it's kind of floating out there. Um, I believe what you are supposed to do is there's like a note from like when you play it that says start stairway to heaven here because they didn't have permission to use it. They got permission for oh, some music, oh, but they didn't yeah. have permission to put stairway in the movie. So you're given a little note, maybe like on a menu that says, you know, at one thirty one fifteen start stairway. Does it ever? This is this is just kind of an off the hip question here in regard to mu- music that has that pertains to this movie and uh, Francis McDormand's attitude toward it. So, you know, obviously every generation has their their rock stars, and it, it feels like, especially how it's portrayed in, in movies, that the parents are always against it. So whether it's Detroit Rock City or mm. this movie or whatever, there's always going to be a band where the parents are like, ah, oh, it's promoting satan or whatever um do you guys ever just get a big old grin on your face for like if you're saying Stillwater is promoting satan man i hope you live another 40 years to see what rock music is now <laughs> like like it, so it's just it's funny to me because i always see that portrayal the, the the angry parent that doesn't understand the music and i'm just wondering what 20 years from now my take is going to be on things for my daughter because i i i see this happening this has got to be a stereotype that came from somewhere so i'm just curious like what am i in for well brian i can tell you i can tell you from experience you know because my kids are getting up there high school even college uh i can tell you from experience that i think if you have an open mind about music i think you'll be just fine i mean my son listens you know he's got me listening to hip-hop now and um you know new rock bands and and all kinds of um i don't know it's like electronic music and just dubstep and all kinds of stuff i never would have listened to and i have a totally open mind about it so i think that you can make that transition without becoming you know your parent or grandparent uh in the future but uh, i think it's funny also in the movie it's hilarious kind of hilarious that she you know that Simon and Garfunkel are on. Oh, the I know. Yeah. to sneak that album into the <laughs> so house. So yeah. if you start at that base level, you know you're in trouble with Led Zeppelin <laughs> and, uh, and everything on the Who. Um, but yeah, Simon and Garfunkel is, is not allowed in the house. So uh, yeah, it's rough. It's rough. I love it when she's like, "Look, he's high," and she's like mm-hmm. pointing at his eyes, like, <laughs> "Come on, man." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, there's a natural barrier for me to explore new genres, but the moment anyone introduces it to me um, and I'm in an open-minded mood, uh, there's rarely anything I truly don't enjoy. Th- this parental aversion from it, uh, I-, I, don't, I don't know if I could ever really just completely turn my mind off to something new. I would agree with that, but at the same time, if you know my kid rolled in with the equivalent of like 
ICP or something, I'd be like, uh, you're you're better than that. You know what's wild? <laughs> I like some ICP stuff. <laughs> and I can't, and I feel like I can't even say that really with a straight face because there was a point in time in college where I was listening to a lot of like mindless self indulgence, which is mm. almost the same thing. Like it's it's almost the same thing. Like the only difference is they weren't on wrestling. Right. So. So uh, with that, let's uh, let's talk about Almost Famous. So if you have not seen this movie yet, I highly recommend you hit pause right now, take a break, watch two hours and however many minutes, depending on which edition you watch, and uh, we'll be back to you with this plot summary. Welcome to the Flashback Flicks Retro Movie Podcast. I'm Ricky. I'm Grayson. And every week we review a movie from the past and reflect on things we miss, things we loved, and things we want to see again. Yeah, because we believe any movie worth watching is worth watching again. So if you like films, friendship, and a lot of callbacks, I mean, just so many callbacks, then subscribe on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever RSS feeds go for like-minded, movie-loving individuals. Like you. What happens when two modern film fans go back and rewatch all the old classic films from yesteryear to see if they hold up? You get the Classic Film Jerks podcast. Find the Classic Film Jerks podcast on all the major platforms. All right, welcome back. Uh, right now we are going to be doing our plot discussion and plot summary for Almost Famous. So last chance to bail out. This is... The story of Almost Famous. Dustin. It's the late 60s, and we're introduced to a California family just in time to see a teenage daughter, Anita, leave the house and be free from domineering mom, leaving behind our hero, William, and her stash of rock albums. Fast forward four years, 15-year-old William meets rock journalist Lester Bangs, who offers him a job writing a piece on Black Sabbath. Here he meets the members of Stillwater, with a special group of music-loving uber groupies called the Band-Aids, led by Penny Lane, with whom William is obviously smitten. Ben Fong Torres reads William's work and hires him to join Stillwater's almost famous tour, where he objectively remains a good boy, calls his mother, parties, secures all but one interview, and witnesses all sorts of rock and roll hijinks including band fallout, the gambling and auctioning of teenage girls, proclamations of godhood, recovery from overdose, and a near-death experience that results in the band members confessing all their secrets to one another. The time comes to publish the article, but Russell, the guitarist, in an effort to ensure that the band retains its cool image, denies all the reporting to the fact-checker. Only by being tricked to visit William's house does he finish his interview and confirm the story, and Stillwater gets on the cover of Rolling Stone. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is, this is a fun movie guys. Uh, we really, I, I get into, to music movies, not music. Well, I get into musicals too, but this is a movie that promotes the music. So is there anything else that you've seen like this film? I mean, I can't think of anything quite like this. Um, I know I, I, I forced my kids to sit down and watch this movie with me on my second viewing. And they were referring to some of the newer. They were they were referring to some of the newer um, uh, biopics, um, specifically the the Queen uh, biopic. But I definitely okay. wouldn't compare yeah. the two in any way um, because even though this movie, for me, I enjoyed so much about the music and the 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 passion behind the music. It really is a story about people. Um, trying to find their way in the real world. So I think it's much deeper than a, than a, than a big budget biopic. Um, oh, I, so yeah, I completely know. agree. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't, I haven't, I can't think of a movie. I will continue to think about it, but I this is final tap, maybe quite, quite like this. <laughs> that, one, well, it's, that one's way too it's funny. De- <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> definitely a movie from, I feel like the fan perspective, like the band is a folk, a focal point. But it's about the, the people, the consumers of the music, I think, more, whereas something like The Dirt about Motley Crue is just about Motley Crue. So um, I think that is something, kind of what I was getting at. I think there is something about Almost Famous that taking it from that fan – I mean, I guess you could say Detroit Rock City was from the fan's perspective as well. But again, that was that was more of a comedy. I know this one kind of gets a comedy tag at times, but – you know, moreover, I think this is more of a, a, a drama about folks who who enjoy either crafting or consuming the art. Yeah, it, it is unique in um, 
I guess like the idea it's a it's a fictional band, but we've got great music that was written in part by Cameron Crowe and his I think then wife the uh, songwriter for Heart. Like like we 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 have we have good music. Um, I I I know that we sometimes you know get a little bit on the soundtrack, but um, when it comes to uh, a soundtrack made of like period music or like uh what what's the specific term for it or like like a compiled soundtrack not an original score there's a specific category for it for the oscars but um i know that like certain movies have historically great ones and i would say like this this movie also does not rock to sleep with it but you feel comfort with this music uh, it that's is, how i it put is kind it of, it's right completely comfort music yeah, and, which is funny because you know we're talking about it being comfort music, and this mom is like, "This will rot your brain." So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it is it's all it's relative. Funny. Yeah, exactly. It is completely all relative. Um, I before we dive right into the cast, one of the things that that really blew my mind about this watch this this round of uh, viewing, I forgot how many people were in this. Like in two thousand. Anna Paquin was not a household name. Zoe Deschanel was not a household name. You know, Jason Lee had done, uh, you know, his stuff with uh, with uh, Smith. So it, it, Kate Hudson was just coming into her stardom. This has got a lot of people in it. And then there's there's the stars who are who are big time now that are sprinkled throughout this thing. And you're like, oh, I didn't even think about Jimmy Fallon in 2000. <laughs> like as a yeah, so anyway, I that was one of the most fun pieces of the this rewatch for me is where I'm like, oh, that's holy dude, him too. Like, <laughs> well, all of these people fit into their own little mini stories of what's happening along the way. Now, um, there's sometimes when I put together a plot summary that you know I'm just I'm trying to keep it under three minutes or so. I'm trying to keep it you know under you know, 250 words or something, but we've got a lot of different stories with, uh, that all, you know, sort of, they're working together. They're all following the same tour. So you mentioned mom, right? Frances McDormand. We got mom. She's a really inspiring, like character. Like she wants, she wants what's best out of anyone she comes in contact with, whether that's over the phone or her own children. Obviously, we see that this is this pushes Anita away, right? But mm. uh, throughout the movie, just little like it, twice it said after a phone call, like well, your mom really freaked me out. Um, <laughs> so so we have we have her her kind of like wanting to look out for her boy. So we we have William who's trying to get into music publisher uh, not publishing uh journalism rock journalism and he's got speaking of another you know one of your awesome like not not even cameos just like an extra person peppered in um he, he's got his like mentor in a way philip seymour hoffman uh lester bangs who yeah um, who is like apparently a real person there's there's some like real people like peppered in to this movie um so you, you've got his sort of drive and desire you have stillwater's desire to make it but then we also get like what's real about them um a lot of different storylines uh and, and they take advantage of you know jimmy fallon might not be that memorable at the time but he he fits into what stillwater wants which is to make it bigger be more successful like so all, all it's it's not that these people are just standing around waiting for screen time. Everyone fits into the ultimate goal of these uh, of these these same storylines that are floating down the river together. Absolutely. So uh, I'm gonna do a, a kind of a, a broad strokes cast piece here, uh, but then as we go through with some of our you know recast, change one thing, supporting actor stuff probably point out a few other uh, faces that you probably recognize. But um, first bill on this is going to be uh, Billy Crudrup uh, as Russell Hammond. We have Frances McDormand as Elaine Miller. We have Kate Hudson as Penny Lane. Jason Lee as Jeff Beebe. 
Uh, Patrick Fugit is William Miller. Zoe Deschanel is Anita Miller. Uh, Michael Aragno as William, young William. Uh, Anna Paquin as Palexia. I still cannot stand that name. I couldn't stand it in 2000. <laughs> I can't stand it now. Like, all, Alexia all of, Aphrodisia. Yeah, it just, it, oh, it just, that it's sucks. still. That might be made up. I, it might, it might, might not I, be her real name. <laughs> I, I, Surprise. I, yeah. I know. Um, but, and then Philip Seymour Hoffman as Lester Bangs. Uh, Jimmy Fallon gets in there as uh, Dennis Hope later on in the movie. So uh, there are some other uh, notable cameo pieces, if you will. Uh, they weren't really cameos at the time because these people weren't well known. But now you look at it and you're like, oh, what's up, Dwight? Yeah. That's the first person <laughs> I thought of. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, so it's that sort of thing, but this is a, this is a very long cast rundown. There's a lot of people. I mean, Peter Frampton's in this movie. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, I, I feel like they did such a fun job as not just a who's who considering it's a fake band they're going into, but then there was also real people, you know, they reference and name drop stuff like Dylan, obviously black Sabbath. um, you know, you get to see David Bowie's hair. <laughs> it just, it's one of those things where they did a really good job, like steeping this other band in the lifestyle of real people that were really happening during the time. I thought that was really cool. And they did it in a way I think would have been very budget friendly. Yeah. I mean, the, the I'd like that. Just add quickly. I mean, the, the cool thing about this movie is that this was Cameron Crowe's like, experience. You know, like he lived this. And that's probably, I would assume, why it does come across as authentic as it does. Um, plus, like uh, like you guys mentioned earlier, um, you've got uh, Peter Frampton working on some of the original songs. Um, and it just really comes across as very authentic. And they, they're, they're careful not to push it too far in terms of trying to show, like you said, show Bowie's like face or to try to recreate anything like that. But... I think it does come across as very authentic. Yeah, they'll they'll name drop, but they're not trying to steal any of its thunder by actually, you know, going that route. Uh, Dustin, in terms of how this movie was made, how how did you feel about the styling? It's about what is happening backstage, and not just backstage at the shows, but backstage at the hotels, backstage at partying. The the style is. So it's this is supposed to be like a like a deep dive into like this was my experience as, as John mentioned, and this was something very cool, almost fanciful, almost incredibly unbelievable, uh, to like use the the later on in the movie when um, Ben and Dwight, <laughs> his name isn't Dwight, but uh, when, when they're like kind of reading over the story, like did this really happen? And, and then the the interaction with these these groupies, interaction with fans. Uh, the band falling apart in a way like there's this type of thing is it, it got to the point to where the music in it that they, that Stillwater performs um, and I'm not sure if like how much movie magic was done uh, to whether or not it was actually Noah Taylor screaming out Stillwater or whether it was actually Jason Lee singing I, I don't have any details on that but I would say that like the music they perform when we have let's just say it's a total of three full minutes over like five scenes of like of them performing in front of these screaming fans it's almost like icing on top like it it did it because most of this movie is focused on what's going on behind the scenes you almost didn't have to have that at all and the fact that we got it was even better than you could have hoped um and they could have been performing not original music. They could have been performing covers, and we would have liked it just the same, I think. So it was kind of a bonus that we got all this stuff. John, you mentioned very early, saying like the like how this is in the real world. And we get a difference from a 15-year-old's point of view to Penny Lane and her Band-Aids, specifically the idea that they're not living in a real world, that they're completely disillusioned all the time their conflict as to like you know what's real you're kind of living in this fantasy land where all that matters is following the music whether you're on the the roadies bus or whether you're on the tour bus or whether you catch your own flight it's all like a, a, a chaos that should be uncomfortable but when you put this movie together it seems like 
Well, these people seem to make it, and that's good. You're rooting for them. I, I definitely think it's an experience that I always wanted to have. Um, just just from a enjoyment of music standpoint, um, obviously some of these people's lives aren't ones that you're like, okay, sign me up for this. But at the same time, just from a I, can I call it an anthropological standpoint? I'm curious to like witness it in real time. Like even if you had no effect on it, like you find uh, William's character he is and isn't an influence on him. Like he does try to keep his journalistic distance, but like Philip Seymour Hoffman ends up telling him, he's like, Oh man, you befriended him. (laughs) Like that's, you know, right. You fell into the trap. Yeah. And I, but so, and I can completely see how that would happen. I'll leave it to this movie. I'll leave it to these movies to give me this type of experience or documentaries. Um, I'm fine at home. I'm okay. I'm okay with this being the way I experience it. I would, uh, I I would say that if if I had a bucket list thing, put me on six stops of Pearl jams next tour. Like my my question, just, just to bear witness. My question, though, would be, and there's a huge distinction between the music and the performance and like like the backstage lifestyle that this band has, that Stillwater has, along with the other larger bands they're touring with. I mean, that we all know that doesn't exist today. You know, everybody flies in on a private jet. You know, they do the show. They all fly back home to their multi-billion dollar home and they go back to bed. I mean, for the most part, or if they stay at a hotel, it's, you know, it's it's. It's, oh, it's kind I, of the romanticism of the romanticism, of, romanticism of the movie is that this doesn't exist anymore. But I, and I get where you're coming from. It would still be cool to to be with the band and to see it, you know, pulled off. I, um, I think I think you're absolutely right that it doesn't happen with the the you know Bowie now. Like Billie Eilish wouldn't be doing this, or you know, take your pick of whoever is a main headliner. You know, Lady yeah. Gaga, whatever. No, it doesn't happen for them. But there are bands like Stillwater who are trying sure. to make it, yeah. still take a bus across the country. That still, yeah. you know, that still is a thing. Now, is it as epic where they're renting out an entire floor of a hotel and you know just having a knockdown drag out party? Probably not. But I bet it still <laughs> gets pretty interesting. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, I like uh, hearing some of these stories, even though this has been a, a, a long a, a long time since I've cared about this fandom at all. But you, you listen to these retired pro wrestlers about their time on the road. Um, and, and it makes me think of like this kind of um, where the road is wild and there's and there's stuff that could not have been predicted at all, whether it's a fight or whether it's a. Uh, you know, driving by a bunch of high school girls on their track and like their uh, cross country team, and they all wake up. Yo, high school girls! Like, like there's there's a bunch of stuff. Uh, I mean, most most of these stories involving like the, like these pro wrestlers and stuff. They involve like, well, we could not find enough bottles of Jim Beam to make this. To, to eat, you know, or uh, Andre the Giant decided to drink eighty beers that day. Um, and right. so, like, like this this wild rock and roll backstage lifestyle is what is fun let's take let's think of some of these scenes in the movie right um the uh road manager i think it's the the road managers like poker game where they're trading uh they're they're gambling like all right uh 12 pack of heineken and three of the um band-aids band-aids yeah and, oh they're gonna go with humble pie yeah 50 bucks in a, in 50 a, bucks case, in a of case of heineken yeah um you know things like that. Um, the idea that uh, at one of the shows, I believe it's R- Russell gets electrocuted by the mic. Um, yeah. And and so that turns into them piling on the bus and busting through the gate to get out of there, which we then learn is something that had they had a more experienced manager, they would have turned it into something else. Like all this crazy stuff that the movie shows. Um, I I don't think the movie is about the crazy stuff but having enough of that in there made this such a thrill ride uh to to see these fun little things happening and then you get some drama too with uh 
you know, um, leading on these girls or um, you get some comedy with the, uh, you know, it's all about the music, man. Oh, and the chicks are great, too. Like, like, like the, the, this type of the, there is a, uh, a stereotype that is presented. There is a uh, like an understanding that like this caricature, not caricature, this representation of what a band like Stillwater would be is probably pretty accurate that there's like one musical genius in there that could potentially be a big star. Then there's like the front man who is secretly super envious about it. There's the like forgotten drummer. Like like it's this all creates a believable type of story without really, I'm going to say without anybody really getting hurt. There's this, would you say this movie kind of has a happy ending? Nobody Before ends I, up really on the outs, right? Before I answer that, I want to – I can't remember the exact quote, but it's from the movie That Thing You Do where uh, Tom Hanks is going through each member of the band and saying, like, he's the talent, you're the heart. I can't remember what the other two guys' monikers were, but he uh, he was basically giving out these, these superlatives on what they do for the group. And – I think that's that's probably true of every band. And in this one, you see kind of one of Stillwater's uh, Achilles heels or, or, you know, what will eventually probably, you know, bring them down is the fact that it's partially manufactured. You know, you have Jason Lee's character talking. He's like, no, you're this and I'm this. And, you know, they're trying to cookie cutter themselves into other bands who have had success and where they were. You know, you kind of get this feeling toward the end of the movie where, you know, he's trying to talk it out with Russell and he's, you know, kind of shifting around it, but comparing themselves to like Keith Richards and Mick Jagger. And they're like, yeah, you know, the front guy and the lead guitarist, they always hate each other. They do. (laughs) <laughs> Probably, like you know, like they're just yeah. they're just making stuff up. So it's it's one of those things that that I think you find that this band was never really authentic, and I think that's Russell's problem with it. Jason Lee is more uh, willing to embrace it, but at this point they've become so popular that none of them wants to start over and try it again. So they're just kind of along for the ride. Right, it's working. Yeah. Right? Uh, you had to bring up that thing you do. I was like, hey, we're not the wonders today. We're Captain Geach and the Shrimp Shack Shooters. Uh, <laughs> the own eaters. Own eaters. <laughs> the own eaters. Uh, yeah, so, like, but it's working. And they're, they're loved by the fans. We do learn along the way from uh, Jimmy Fallon's Dennis Hope says, like, your records are selling. We can, we can make you a bigger hit than you are. At this point, I think maybe they don't even know. Yeah, they, at this point, they don't know that they're up for the cover of Rolling Stone. Uh, that happens after they land in New York. So, like this, this pathway to success for them uh, has these little stories, right? And the the, the stories um, weave in. And I guess this, I'm, I'm trying to get. I, I want to open it up to you two. They open up Russell's relationship with Penny Lane. Um, and, and it makes me think about the idea of groupies or just music fans. Um, is like how, how important is, and obviously, Hey, Kate Hudson's face is the movie poster. So how important is like that this story? And it's kind of a triangle, right? We've got Russell, Penny, and William. Is that, is that sort of what we're following is, is this? Cause it, it seems to get pretty heavy into that sort of, triangle relationship in the second half of the movie almost i'm not gonna say almost exclusively but that's the main thing throughout uh it does that matter to you guys as much as the other things we've already described in this podcast i think so uh there's there's a part of me that wants to take each relationship apart in this like yeah you could say the triangle piece you know he's in love with her she's in love with him he's in love with himself um so it, it's it's more of a, a chain i guess than a triangle yeah um so the the thing that's that's kind of rough about this movie and i think what gives it a lot of its chops is 
in a lot of coming of age movies, bad things happen, and that's how they come of age. This absolutely insane things happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is I can't imagine being in a situation at fifteen once that this guy was on a dozen times. Like, at each new venue, there's something else or something crazier. Now, look, I'm not going to say I've never seen anybody jump off a house into a pool, but I've never seen someone (laughs) who is the lead guitarist of a popular rock band jump off a a house into a pool on acid, had to then, you know, get retrieve him, get him back on a bus. You know, this is this is a get him to the Greek moment where you're like, you got to you got to mine. Yeah. Beep it, him, you know, it, try, yeah, try it, to get him to the next stop. He finds himself in like the, in that particular uh, novella of this movie, in that particular little box story. He's kind of responsible for making sure he's all right. I mean, there was just the fallout. Was that the, was that the result of the fallout of the t-shirts having him and the rest right. of the band blurred out? Yeah. Uh, screw you walks out. Um, funny, great little comedic moment there where, uh, William comes back and actually takes the rejected t-shirt, puts it in his bag, but it, they go to the, they go to the party and he's kind of like, I still believe, and they do this a lot, like the reason he's attached to the hip to Russell is because he's still trying to get that interview. And it just, it never, ever happens. He's always trying and it just never works out. Um, but yeah, like he he, he does find himself in all these crazy situations. I think William's, William is the youngest person involved in all of this stuff and he is the only adult there. (laughs) Yeah. Like that is the, the, I mean, he's the one who's trying to keep his professionalism, even though he's 15 and faking being an older journalist. Like, he's in love with this girl who's clearly underage and hanging out with guys who are clearly not, you know, of sign mind and, and whatever. So I, it just it's it's an interesting dichotomy to see how this world stays together because everybody does have a part to play. And it keeps the ball rolling, I guess, would be the way to put it. John, what do you think? The thing about this movie that I feel like there's the dividing line between the the the, the life they're living and the reality that they're hiding from. You know, yes. it's it's it, for for every character except for Fugit's character. I think I think he's living in reality, but everybody else in the band and the Band Aids, they're all kind of on this extended summer vacation, and. One of the takeaways my wife and I had, my wife and I had on this movie versus the kids, you know, the kids thought it was okay, but I don't really think a kid can understand what this movie is trying to say, you know, because what this movie is trying to say is, you know, we all at some point want to get back on the bus, you know, we all would like to go somewhere where there are no worries, um, and it's right about the next stop and the next party. Yeah, ju- just yeah. one more stop. Just come yeah. come with us to Columbus. Come with us to New exactly. York. You know? Yeah. And 100%. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's why I think that's why um, he can't get the interview is because the interview is like symbolic of reality. And right. and not doing the interview kind of allows uh, Russell to continue to live in this kind of like weekend world or like I said, summer vacation world or whatever you want to call it. But it's this world where time is just – doesn't matter and and reality doesn't exist um and all of the characters are either trying to are either successfully living in that moment and not even thinking about you know the rest of their life or like penny lane she's faking like it doesn't bother her like the real things don't bother her when as the movie goes on and certainly at the end you realize that you know all the real things were bothering her yeah, so I think that's to me that's the biggest takeaway of the movie and kind of the tone is is that is that difference between the life they the, the life they fantasize and the life they want to stay in, but the, the reality keeps popping back in. You know, yeah, it's I, the T-shirt and the band getting angry about that, or 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 him going to New York and his girlfriend is there, and, and Penny Lane needs to go away. You know, and, and there's just I don't think there's repeated uh, scenes gotta, where it, there's that battle. His mom calling is reality. And then there's the road. Um, He's got a stage nine clinger. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. 
I think you're absolutely right. Uh, what we learn from uh, Russell, Russell says to William, this is the circus and nobody wants to go home. Like you, you hit the nail on the head, I think. is, is they, Some of them do realize it, that we're just trying to extend, you know, hey, one more time back on the merry-go-round. But um, other others are unfamiliar un- un- with like what it is that they're escaping from. I think you put that really well. So let's uh, let's talk about this director for a hot second because he is a very integral part of what makes a lot of his music movies tick. So you have Cameron Crowe here. He's done Say Anything. John, you mentioned 1992 singles, which, uh, fun tidbit about that, the original cut for what would become Soundgarden Spoon Man was part of that uh, film. So that, that film will always hold a special place in my heart. Um, he did do Jerry Maguire, uh, obviously not music-related. Uh, then the almost famous uh, Vanilla Sky, Elizabeth Town, which is actually a really underrated movie for me. Uh, I actually really enjoyed uh, Elizabeth Town. Uh, he did a documentary on Pearl Jam. He's done one on David Crosby. He was a writer for Fast Times at Ridgemont High. He did a movie in 2016 called Roadies. So, I mean, this guy enjoys this topic. Uh, is there anything, if you can give me like a short list, is there anything else in his repertoire where you're like, oh, I love that movie? Or, you know, have you seen any of the others? What what are What's your take on Cameron Crowe? I will be the first to admit I've never seen Jerry Maguire. It's fine. Um, my wife, <laughs> yeah, that's cool. her head, my wife's head almost exploded, but I've never seen Jerry Maguire. You know, like this movie, there's some, there's obviously some, some unforgettable lines uttered by some of the characters. Uh, so I'm aware of Jerry Maguire, but I've, I've never seen it. I'd say, I, um, of course, I've seen Fast Times Original High, uh, which I did not realize was a book that, I, that apparently he wrote. Yeah. Um, I did not know that. Um, so this guy's lived quite a life, at least in his younger years. He definitely had some experiences. Uh, if Fast Times is anything close to anything he actually experienced. Um, uh, and I, I saw Almost Famous, but that was so long ago. Um, you know, other than John Cusack with the boombox, you know, playing uh, Peter Gabriel on it. It's hard to remember any of that movie. Uh, so no, say, unfortunately, say I have to yeah, say anything. What did yeah. I say? Something else? You said, you said Almost Famous. Oh, I, yeah. I did see, I have watched Almost Famous. Me too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, I... I <laughs> it's funny you bring this up because I actually toyed with the idea one time of coming into a movie that I hadn't seen before and not watching it and seeing how far I could get into the podcast without anyone realizing I hadn't seen the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you have to pick the right – for some movies, that's definitely possible, I would say. Oh, 100%. For I, others, I, no, I, but – I feel like I, I live in the movie vacuum so much that, that I have at least heard enough about most films to fake it until I make it. Yeah. Uh, so I'm yeah, sorry. So that, I, let me interrupt. I just. <laughs> yeah, like Jerry Maguire, I know there's a football player. I know there's, you had me from the first, uh, I don't know, first time I saw you or first look or whatever. So I'm you had me at hello. That. Had me at hello. You had dude. me at hello. Almost uh, fake it for a little while. Uh, but no, I, I don't have a lot of experience with his um, with his movies. I would say that, it, or Dustin, uh, tell me about your experience. Uh, all I all that really matters to me here is his description of why it was the right time to make this movie, um, which is a you know this is kind of a spin move to not talk about other movies and get back to this movie, but it's also <laughs> that uh, when you hit the jackpot like jerry Maguire. he he said like hey i got a line of credit now like what because this was such an incredible success i can make the movie i want to make and he did and we know that this is kind of um autobiographical um we know that he has all of these awesome like rock and roll friends which allow him to do this um you mentioned how much the movie made this movie did not make its budget back we 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 missed it by 14 million now it's still rated an incredibly like you know like like impactful movie um and and people will uh look back at it fondly uh it was nominated for um and won best original screenplay which is actually my favorite academy award 
so like this this passion project when it comes to fruition when these passion projects come to fruition which he was allowed to do because of Jerry Maguire's success uh and you know four years time he wasn't doing anything else in between then so like like this was uh it's not a budget home run but it is a uh oh that's what he wanted to make so he made it and I think Fry, you and I, um, will will say like we know other directors like this, right? Oh, that's David Lynch wanted to make a David Lynch movie, right? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, and so what we got was Crow wanted to make this exact thing. It doesn't matter that it failed to make its budget back, not at all. It ends up being a great um, experience, regardless. Um, so while yeah, I, I mean, I could talk about Vanilla Sky. A little bit. I could talk about We Bought a Zoo a little bit. Uh, I like Fast Times. Um, I uh, what's, I was what's, perp- I was purpose- purposely leaving We Bought a Zoo off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, good call. <laughs> but, that was, uh, that was, right. That was... But like uh, you know, you, the, uh, the he did a documentary on Pearl Jam, and it makes me think that like my favorite rock documentary ever done was on uh, the little. That's the wrong thing to say. The well, he is short in stature. The like Filipino frontman for Journey. You guys ever seen that documentary? The idea of them finding the guy that sounded like he, he they found him singing karaoke Journey songs, and then they they brought him in, and he is now touring with Journey as the new frontman. Um, like I like documentaries, and this kind of feels as if a fun documentary and not a mockumentary. This movie. Um, and it was because Cameron Crowe decided to do exactly what he wanted to do. I think that, that one – the best accolade I could give this movie, and and I feel like this is probably a, maybe the best compliment you can give a movie is this movie does a phenomenal job of towing the line of entertainment with message. So I feel like this is one of the few movies that you could have warm receptions at both – you know, people's homes and Sundance. And that doesn't always happen. Right. I see what you're saying. And, and I think that's, that's a cool thing about this movie because yeah, there are a lot of, you know, uh, nearly famous to will be more famous later people in this movie. So home runs were hit there. You got people who can really show feeling, um, you know, the, the, the pieces where he's talking to Philip Seymour Hoffman are my favorite parts of this film. And it's, it, it's such a fun thing when you can watch a movie that isn't tailored to be an Oscar winner, but it's also not tailored to be just a fun box office piece. Like, it really toes that line so well of being something that's relatable to all those who like film. The statement, there's a something for everybody, isn't right. Like, it's close, but, like, it doesn't it fully encapsulate what you just said. Um, I'm on drugs! <laughs> like, it just, like, put humor to this. My last words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of those um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, like, phone calls. Um, I thought those were really well done. I, I, particularly the last one where he's like, dude, I've met you. You're not cool. Um, I, I like those a lot. Um, I really like Jason Lee's, um, he's so quick to start yelling about something and what he's yelling, he, he's kind of letting his reality come out in the moment before he wants to get back to the party. Um, which is really fun for me. Uh, it, it like one, because I wouldn't say I was a Jason Lee fan. This may be the only movie where I can point out like oh, i really dig his performance but uh, well, i do i do like dogma a lot um dogma is my favorite of the uh, uh of that uh view universe actually strangely enough uh, i don't think it's everybody's favorite but um the the you you take some of those like uh wild kind of fun um exclaiming like comedic moments and then you also have them juxtaposed to like Everybody singing Elton John on the bus together. And that's a really cool moment. It might bring you back some nostalgia. Uh, or it might just make you feel like everybody's comfortable. The music is making them comfortable again. And that, that 
made me feel good. When, when I was watching it, I was actually like, uh, um, I, I was trying to t- t- like keep note of what soundtrack things I really liked. Um, and there was something that bugged me that they cut a little bit of the uh, sort of the ramp up to the chorus in Tiny Dancer, but I'm not going to hold it against them. It, that, that scene works as much as it as the other scenes work, as much as the overdose scene works, as much as all the like th- these things all have like an equal input to success it, you know, by themselves. If the movie was just the tone of one of these little side stories, it wouldn't succeed. All of these different little stories of uh, manipulation or lying to each other or themselves like the, the the tone of it isn't overall dark but having a little bit of dark pieces here and a little bit of fanciful pieces here really make this work it makes it real i you know he's russell talks about real so much in this when he lives in a vacuum of fake and i feel like that is what makes this real because you have these pieces that are like a, you know, a glass of water in the face that you know, these are all real things that can happen to you while you're living this kind of lifestyle. You know, we spend a lot of time on buses, campgrounds, backstage. I, I never really got the feeling that this movie spent a ton of money on sets and whatnot. Uh, John, did you take anything in particular out of, uh, you know, the, how this movie was shot in terms of a moving parade? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, I actually did. There were a few things that 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 uh, popped out for me. Um, uh, I I noticed uh, doing some research about the film that some of the scenes were shot on location where some of these actually took place. Um, at least you know uh, similar things took place when Cameron Crowe was you know younger and writing some of these articles and following some of these bands. So I thought that was interesting. Um, I. I, you know, I like period pieces, so you know that that late '60s, early '70s is great. So, like the house and the decor in the house was, I think, well done. I think the first thing that really um, caught my attention was the the first arena that they were playing at. It kind of reminded me of some of the broken down old arenas in South Florida that maybe maybe I would have seen a show in in the '80s. Um, this kind of these hulking monstrosities, you know, possibly in the middle of nowhere, you know, with huge parking lots. I know down in Florida, we had the Hollywood Sportatorium uh, and Sunrise Musical Theater kind of reminded me of that first show where he went to go see Black Sabbath. Um, don't do drugs. <laughs> yeah, don't, do, don't do drugs. Um, you know, <laughs> the behind the stage was quite the little mini city and i and i kind of wondered if i can't imagine that that's that must have been what it was really like um like i was saying earlier i can't imagine that a tour is anything like that now with just a hustle and bustle of people on the background it's there's probably almost nobody there now um but but then it did seem like we said earlier it's almost like a circus there's like you, you're carrying this whole group of people along with you you know every stop along the way John, I used to go every single year when I lived in uh, North Carolina to Carolina Rebellion, and I feel oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. I feel like this this still happens in that scenario, like the big three day massive shows where you've got you know thirty two bands playing. Like yeah. I, I still think that that some of this exists. At least I hope it does. Like obviously, I don't want people ODing or anything like that. But the rock star image the the lifestyle i think still exists somewhere um it just depends on what level you're at yeah like my favorite places to go you know you're familiar with them here in the durham area but like cat's cradle oh yeah like oh my you know, gosh like that you know those guys you know i've seen i hate to say it i've seen a number of bands there that i, I can barely afford to go see now oh absolutely they don't play cats <laughs> yeah right. they, they've moved up in the right. world you know <laughs> But uh, you can imagine your typical Cat's Cradle band, like uh, you can see the bus is out in front, you know, the bus right. is like a shopping center. The bus is parked out front, you know, the band you know, comes through the back door and they're up on this stage. So, yeah, I totally can see that at that level, um, you know, it definitely exists. Um, getting back to the set, though, I, I would say that I thought that the the rock performances that were recorded, I thought those were very realistic. Um, yeah. 
I know that's something I've read about this movie. That it's, they usually gain pretty high praise for that. I know they had some technical advisors, like I mentioned before, Peter Frampton was one of them. I know there was a rock camp where all the band members learned to, to realistically play the instruments. Um, I know that Jason Lee, uh, he that, that was not his voice singing, but I did find it to be very believable. Yeah. Um, and I thought that the that the interiors of the arenas. I know it was a mix of, of actual people, uh, of extras being moved around and, and maybe some fill-ins in the, in the larger arenas. But I thought all that was very realistic. And I thought it looked great. Um, I, will, I will say this for this movie. This is the first movie we have done where I have struggled as hard as I have to pick a best shot, best scene. Like, you know what's wild? I, I, I agree with you. I, 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 I had so many. Too. And I, I'll bring this one up now because it's not going to make my superlatives, but it hurts me that it can't. I absolutely love the scene with um, Kate Hudson's Penny Lane dancing in the empty auditorium with the trash yeah. on the and with the flower. Like, that's a moving shot. Like that, um, yeah. it's to this day, I'm, I like, I didn't appreciate it enough when I saw it as a younger person. But I, I just I watched it this time around and I was just like, man, that's like I'm not trying to make it into like an American Beauty plastic bag flying in the wind kind of moment. <laughs> but I just it was it was a moving shot underneath the stadium. I've been underneath several. I've been up in the rafters of a couple. They did feel real. And like uh, you use the term like little mini cities. Um I think even at the very end, maybe like 15 minutes till, you know, we, we roll credits. You've got Firuza Balk's character talking to Russell. Uh, I think her name's Sapphire. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sapphire is talking yeah. to Russell and they're at like a breakfast buffet, I think. And it's just set up on six foot tables, probably the same ratty six foot tables that have existed underneath that stadium for decades, but they've got, you know, uh, hotel pans of eggs and bacon. And she even says like, ah, these they eat all the steak. <laughs> they eat all <laughs> the steak. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I think that that, that scene also is really important because you, throughout the movie, you get a certain degree of, you know, these girls are here for the, the you know, the limelight or not necessarily the limelight, but the, the inclusionary being part of something big or whatever. And this is the first time outside of Penny Lane, who's breaking away and saying, there's a chance she's remembered more than you are for what Mm. she did for music. And the fact that all of these girls, you know, whether it's, you know, Penny Lane or Anna Paquin or whoever, there's still a record being kept in there. It's not that they're just here for the drugs and the party and whatever, but, you know, she makes a very poignant piece to say, you know, she's meant a lot of things to a lot of bands that aren't just, you know, sexual objectification. And there's a chance that people remember that instead of you. And I, I thought that was one of the most necessary pieces of this movie to add a, um, a component to the band-aids that had been lacking to that point. That's what they must believe at least, right? Um, that they, and this is me coming from a very critical space. Um, I, the, the, I'm coming from a place where like these, these girls are delusional that they are not groupies. Um, which I think we get a little bit into like, like running away from the truth a little bit in Kate Hudson's character, but every, every fan universally, this isn't just music. Every fan has the capability to like, think they're different than the other fans. And that's what we, I, I, I think that's what we get from these band-aids. I mean, it's kind of at first, like it's very quick, even just kind of zigzagged where it's like, Hey, I was the one that said we don't have sex with them anymore. That's right, just blowjobs or whatever the <laughs> line is. It's like the thing about this movie that I, I would say I was a turnoff for me is all of this language about what music is and why it's special to whoever it is that's speaking. 
that type of language that like, uh, you know, the idea that like you create a strata of who understands it and who doesn't. Um, and there's all, there, there's a population of like the moms or the haters that just don't get it. But then there's the idea that like even certain writers or even some extremely respected musicians in the industry have the complete opposite view of how Sid v Vicious really is. These people can't agree on what is actually good or not or what's actually poser or not. So when we have this this group of people in this movie who are like, no, we get it. We actually are the ones who matter. I immediately roll my eyes and like, no, you don't. Just like nobody who ever really believes they get it is the sole person who gets it. This was something I had to fight through to enjoy this movie because we have a lot of it. And so I just, I realized, you know, I needed to at least say my piece on the idea that I'm so glad they kind of made the band members start off with language like, it's about the feel of what music comes from. And then they also give the joke answer, like, and the chicks are nice too, right? Is that it, it's, it's, a, it's a trick of the mind. So this is something that, and it, it happens across everything, is that I'm stealing this line, but like, nerds like a lot of things, but the thing they like most about it is correcting people. So it's like, now you don't understand Led Zeppelin like I do, man. Or it's <laughs> like, uh, yeah, give me a Pink Floyd cut that isn't Dark Side of the Moon or the Wall, dude. Like, like, like that type of thing. There's a lot of that feel in this movie that almost made me say, like, oh, man, am I even enjoying this? But when I took the effort to fight through these attitudes that I generally don't like, I was like, okay, I, I'm, I'm starting to get the full picture, and I'm glad I, wasn't, I didn't turn it off. I'm glad I didn't shield myself from these types of languages in a way. Uh, that, so yeah, I didn't want to take too long on that, but that's just something I noticed the way that the groupies talk about themselves is mattering more than any other groupies. It's like, uh, yeah, you might be remembered more than the band itself. To me, that's BS. I don't think it's remembered in that way. We're not talking about like the annals of history. Like obviously Penny Lane isn't her real name. So there is no remembrance there. I mean, in terms of the people whose lives you touch. So in the end, are people thinking, oh, man, Russell was an awesome guy. I love Russell. But when they think back, dude, Penny Lane, that's a gem right there. I think it's more about the being looked favorably upon by your peers and others. Who was, who was bought and traded like livestock? I mean – I'm like, not disagreeing with that. <laughs> so, so it's like yeah, uh, how much did she matter? Like she believes and the Band-Aids must believe they matter more than what their bodies are. But do any – of these band members or road managers or any of them think of them in the way that they think of themselves, I would bet dollars to donuts. No, they don't. Even Russell, who's like, I got my wife, girlfriend in New York. You are not invited to this restaurant. She shows up and Dick has to like shoo her away. Like, Hey, the roller coasters rides over for you. I've, I'm being so easily discarded is the reality to her. And I think for the rest of the band-aids, um, the, the idea that they, that, and I think this is just a, a lot of, a lot of fans can fit into this group of like, no, I'm, I'm different. I'm special. I, I don't know. Maybe not. That, I don't that's think... maybe, maybe that's the most negative I'll, I'll, I'll sound or be on the podcast today. Uh, well, I definitely see both, both, both the points you guys are making. Um, I'd say that to brought to Brian's point, um, I would say that I think the bigger I think the question you're hitting on is what's more important, what people think about you who actually know you versus the image that's put forth. And I think that's yes. the heart of what she's saying is we know what you did. Um, and and does that matter more than what maybe the rock magazine writer says or what someone sees on TV or, or what someone imagines you to be. Um, on the flip side, you know, I can also see the point of this, this imagined self-importance, like the I get it and you don't. And that's always kind of a, that's a hard thing to stomach because there isn't any one way to get, especially music. 
you know, we could all like the same song, but 10 of us could like the same song, but we could like it for 10 very different reasons. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. So there's no absolution and we get it and you don't. I mean, I think that it kind of fell a little bit into that cliche of like, Oh, here comes the, here comes the next generation, you know, coming in and they're not as good as we, we are or we were, you know, we get it better than they do. And I think maybe that was just kind of, pointing towards the future of rock in general. I mean, uh, you and, know, and, I, and, and it's that, death rows. Yeah, exactly. And it's death rows. I love the line by Jimmy Fallon, speaking of death rows, when he talks about, uh, do you think Mick Jagger is going to be out on stage running <laughs> when he's 50? <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm thinking, well, no, not when he's 50, but he will still be when he's 80 when or he's, almost yeah. 80 or how <laughs> yep. old he is. Uh-huh. Um, speaking about one. the future of rock, that was, that was pretty hilarious. Um, but, yeah, I think it's about evolution and about things changing. But I think for me, the biggest takeaway was that question of, you know, what really does matter? The people who actually know you and what they know and how you've represented yourself to them and what you've done for them or not done for them, uh, you know, versus the image that's that's put out there. Because I think we all would agree that Stillwater is probably not going to end up being one of those legendary bands. Um, so ultimately the only thing you have to hang your hat on is, is, is how you treated people, you know? And in that case, he didn't treat Fugit's character anybody very well, did. well, and, anybody, or anybody, really. or anybody for that matter. Um, and, and that's why he ends up, you know, well, he gets tricked to going back, but in the end, I think he finds his way. Um, so, well, let me ask you a question on that because it's something that, that I always thought was interesting uh, about how the movie played it out, and I'm not sure how the standard cut did it, but when he goes to her house, I'm using air quotes right now, and it's his house, he says, I already called Rolling Stone to say everything was absolutely true. Right. Yeah, he does. So there's there's a piece there where, you know, presumably he's already done that piece outside of asking actual forgiveness from the person who did it. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about Billy's uh, acting chops in this is that little smirk that he gets when some of the worst things that happened in this movie, like you're expecting a blow up or something, and he gets this little smirk when things turn around, like the smirk happened for um, Tiny Dancer, uh, the smirk happened when he realizes whose house he was standing in, like you could see it being a, this is a huge blow to you. You went back to Penny Lane because you realized you were the best you with Penny Lane and she turned you to where you needed to be to, to basically save your soul. So the question is, did he call Rolling Stone just because of the talk he had with Sapphire? Did he call Rolling Stone after trying to get back with Penny Lane? When did that phone call happen? Right, and I don't, I don't know. I I think it was it was after Sapphire, but like, uh, what was it that that made the like? What was the driving motivation of that? Uh, I, I loved how you mentioned that, like, oh, it's like saved his soul. Like that that was a cool way of describing it. And similarly, just five minutes earlier is when uh, I'm grateful that Cameron Crowe made it important to himself to like distinguish between uh you know the guitarist's journey and also the rest of the band who like essentially were just saying like just make us sound cool right which which, like like he is the the things i'm saying about like the hypocrisy of it is Mm -hmm. something that he brought to the forefront i didn't have to dig into the movie to find it it was shown to us um, mm-hmm. and I, I, I was, I was grateful that it was done. If it had been more subtle, um, I don't know if enough people would pick up on it for, to see like what, like part of the, the message being. So yeah, it was, uh, saving, saving his soul by going back to the house. It, it, interesting way of putting it. I, I do agree that it was a combination of the conversation. I don't know if you guys caught that, but that scene, um, the breakfast scene was that was shot, supposedly shot at the orange bowl, which I, I love that as a giant old venue down in Miami that's no longer there. Uh, that definitely caught my eye. Um, and I think that scene is what began his recognition of, you know, he definitely mishandled things and he calls Penny Lane. And then, you know, obviously at some point 
during that, he, he also knew he needed to fix uh, what he had done to William. Um, and, and like you said, it, it does ultimately, you know, save him. It's, um, it's like uh, William's mother was saying, I can't remember exactly how she was saying it, but it was essentially, you know, everybody has a chance. We to, connected. Yeah. yeah it's to, yeah, that's true. Everybody had a, has a chance to, to do the right thing and to, and to, and to, and to, to be a good person. This is off the top of my head, but I, what I, what I'm thinking of right now is there's still time for you to become a person of substance. There you go. That's exactly what she said. Yeah. So, you know, and ultimately that's what we, that's what appears to happen, you know, at the end, of course, you know, um, we don't see what happens after that conversation with William, but you, you would assume that, you know, that's, that's the direction he's headed in. Which is kind of wild that that it, like in her protector role, everyone that she interacts with in this movie is impacted by just her speech. Uh, another thing off the top of my head, she says something like be bold and good fortune will follow behind you. Like, like she's like in a way insufferable, but we get just a small amount of her to like, be like, Oh, this is kind of rad <laughs> every time she's in the movie. Like, um, you know, you're not I mean, getting a Dolores Umbridge from her. You're getting a right. cool, like enlightened mom professor thing. It's cool. You know, I, I used to talk all the time about how, you know, older siblings break down walls for younger siblings. And I do feel like toward, you know, the end of this movie, you see his room. He's got Jimi Hendrix smoking a blunt on his wall. Like clearly the mom is not, you know, green passing that if she hasn't already been worn down to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering by the end of this, like one of the things that I really, really liked about her character specifically is She's very motherly to everyone. Like, it doesn't matter if it's her kids or not. Like, right. she, she, it, within her own constraints, understands that she's trying to do the best by everyone. So when he's, she's talking to Russell, she's talking to Sapphire and everything like that. Like, people tell her the truth as far as it can go. And she not only elicits that, but I think her son also has that skill. The reason people open up to him as a reporter. So you have Sapphire basically just, you know, going probably too far in her <laughs> recollections. And then, you know, going out of her way to say, oh, he's a great guy and we're taking good care of him. And what, like, it's just an interesting thing that she elicits so much of that mom overshare from people because people are nervous that they're talking to a mom. Like right. I, I just I, I do think that there's something there and then obviously her effect on Russell is is hilarious to me. Wouldn't it have been nice if there was at least one scene with her and Lester Bangs? I only <laughs> could wonder what that conversation might have been like. Uh, as far as Lester What's goes, that? the 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 one thing that I love the most about Lester, and I didn't put this in my superlatives either, so I'll talk about it now. Him going on the rant at the radio station with the records, like that's me. That I that's what I do right there. Like that weird little like pulling stuff off the wall, saying this, oh, and just going on a rant about it. Like that I don't write professionally for anything. This is the only thing that I do that gets disseminated to public in any way, shape, or form. And I I love moments like that because of course I would love to be that guy that just rips things that annoys them and then maybe the next week something doesn't. Yeah, and speaking of him as a character, I I, I know you might be as well jealous of his record collection and uh, how he has it organized. It's basically the furniture of his house. It's just yeah. record records leaning up against every wall or or chair in his uh in his apartment or whatever wherever he lives. But um Definitely enviable, although maybe not the best care of records, but, you know. Sure. Uh, back then, they weren't as expensive either. <laughs> a lot, a lot <laughs> of leaning. To find. They were not as a lot of leaning find, going on. Right? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that the, uh, the the quality of record player was probably better than to make up for some of the uh, the junk they've got floating around now. Sure, yeah. We've, we've hit this pretty hard. We've talked about soundtrack and score throughout the entire program. I, I remembered what I was trying to remember from before. It's best compilation soundtrack album. These are normally the types of soundtracks that like I don't like. Um, or I feel like it's too on the nose or I just, maybe I'm just kind of a music snob in that way where I prefer if it's scored by like Hans Zimmer instead of let's put a bunch of contemporary music together. 
um, almost always. That being said, this this one just rocked. It was great. <laughs> no pun intended. It was it was great. I think it worked. Um, so much that I realized uh, that my version of the Who's Sparks that's played in this movie, uh, when it comes on my iPhone, it doesn't have like the uh, the Tommy cover. It has Kate Hudson's face because it's my my version of it is from the Almost Famous soundtrack. For some reason, no idea why. So I just I I think um, it may have made been made specifically for this. Well, yeah, and actually, there's there's. I think it was just two years ago that they finally put everything together in like a five disc set of the stuff you could listen to if you wanted to. But like, yeah, it's not always uh, that I have such high praise for a soundtrack, but this is, this is one of them. I, um, I used to never be a soundtrack person. Uh, I'm taking scores out of this, but soundtracks where they just put a bunch of random songs together. Yeah. Uh, only recently have I really opened myself up, and I actually think Juno was the movie that did it, where I was like, all right, well, here's a bunch of bands that I don't think I could possibly listen to their entire album, but the <laughs> the individual efforts that were put forth to make this movie, I really enjoyed. And uh, uh, Baby Driver was another one. The, I have uh, that one saved. Oh, yeah. dude. Baby Driver was phenomenal. So I've really opened myself up now more to you know, albums like this where if I'm not the biggest fan of maybe the genre as a whole, now I don't think I would buy an almost famous soundtrack because I would probably just buy the individual records for each. Like I actually enjoy this genre, but when it comes to something like Juno where it's a lot of, you know, indie pop and indie rock and stuff like that, they can knock the ball out of the park. Uh, one of the ones I always reference because it hurts me to say how, how good it was is most of the Twilight movies had phenomenal compilation soundtracks. Yeah, the baseball scene is Muse. I, mean, I yeah. mentioned them earlier. And, Super and massive black hole. Like it's uh, uh, Black Keys, Chop and Change. I almost mentioned uh, the Black Keys. Oh my god! Like yeah. like that that might be my favorite Black Keys song. And New Moon. That's where you get it. So <laughs> it's like, which you watch every uh, week, of course we uh, know. I, I listen, um, maybe listen to song, every, but uh, yeah, uh, but the yeah, Guardians, the, the Guardians of the Galaxy soundtracks audience. are incredible. I mean, we, we've we've got a lot of this this stuff that's good. And if it isn't already a genre that you would like, uh, like for instance, could I recommend the entire Tommy soundtrack or the entire Tommy album without the famous, like without? Uh, Tina Turner and Elton John and uh, like all the other uh, guest singers um, maybe not but as part of a compilation like this it, re- it really works so anyway I just want to give my you know my my nod the hats off I it used to be something I criticized truly it used to be something I criticized now I really respect it if they do it well um, so some superlatives guys let's go buckle it down all right John who's your MVP I mean, there's so many, like, like we pointed out, this is a movie that has so many strands running through it that, that, that kind of combine to make this almost perfect rope, you know, of a movie. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think you have to say Patrick Fugit, um, uh, as William. I know that, you know, I've seen some criticisms of him. Uh, I know he was very, very green. It may have, it was uh, probably definitely his first movie. Um, and I know he wasn't, didn't have a lot of acting experience, but, you know, without that character working, you know, the movie would not work. All right. Dustin. That's a good choice. Uh, for me, it's Cameron Crowe, actually. It's his story, uh, no matter how much any of it is embellished or how much of it has changed. Um, you know, we, we learn a little bit if you any amount of digging shows you like things that he will reflect on, especially when it had its 20 year anniversary two years ago. So um, I, I just think that... Uh, uh, when someone has a passion project and they make it and it's as enjoyable as this was, um, the credit goes there. And that's not to take away from the individual performances, but uh, got to give it to him this time. So for me, I went with Billy Kudrow. Russell, I, I identified a lot with Russell's character because over the course of my life, there have been moments where I've had to really address what I was doing in terms of, you know, whatever, like really like watershed moments where I'm like, okay, I'm going to change something drastically here because this isn't working. And 
I loved that about his character in this film and the way that he acted to show it. And I don't know. I just kept going back to him and, and really identifying with it and being like, okay, you know, you, they talk about this entire movie. They they call William the enemy at the end of the movie. It's kind of a sick nickname also. You well, know? no, no, it is. Oh, no, yeah. listen, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not. I'm not disrespecting that in any way, shape, or form. But in the end, it's Den, Den, uh, Jeremy Fallon, or Jer- uh, sorry, Jimmy Fallon. Like that's like literally at the end of this movie. Like there are points where you see Russell make the wrong decision. Yeah, and he wants to make the right decision, but he gets persuaded to not make the right decision. But coming back around again, like that's. That's what's important. That's that's what a character driven a a um, uh, the growth of a character comes from, and and that's what I really love about this movie. Uh, uh, best supporting actor, Dustin. Uh, best supporting for me because I had a feeling that Philip Seymour Hoffman would be picked by one of you two, <laughs> so I, I went Jason Lee as Jeff Beebe. Uh, I, I just I thought um, I I thought he added. And um, not an eccentricity, but just sort of a volume because he does see, tend to scream everything. Um, and uh, the conflict uh, he represents the conflict of the rest of the band versus Russell, um, and he does it well. And uh, yeah, I, I think um, on the plane is when I'm just like, yeah, all right, you know, let it all out. So that, that's my. I, I do love him. I do love him, John. Yeah, you know, it's hard to pick supporting because I mean it's such a large cast. It's so many supporting uh, roles. We, but... we double up all, all the time. Don't censor yourself. <laughs> uh, uh, that's okay. I mean, I, I can go. I'll go with Frances McDormand um, as the mother. I mean, she uh, do we, would we consider her a supporting character, or, or oh, is she really 100%. considered more of a main? Yeah, okay. So to make sure, I mean, she's a she's a very major character to the story, but probably not in the top three. I would I would imagine. Um, I mean, her character. You know, she's that mom, like we've touched upon that, you know, she has her boundaries and she has her, um, she has limits as to her comfort zone, you know, while at the same time, you know, she does tell William, uh, when they're in that, that great car scene, when he realizes that he's a lot younger, uh, <laughs> than, than he thinks, yeah. um, <laughs> she tells him, you know, basically when you get, when you graduate high school, you know, go to Europe, you know, see what's out there, you know, so, so she's a dreamer, but within her, confined limits as to what she finds acceptable you know um but at the same time i'm i don't know if this is um i can't i don't question it too heavily because i know this is based on cameron crow's life and i know that his family life in the movie is i think relatively i won't say accurate but it's it's very close to some of the experiences he had i constantly questioning the fact that she ever allowed william to go on this tour Right. Being where she was coming from, it's kind of like I don't know of any parents who let their kids at 15 in today's day and age go on the bus with a band for I don't know I'm not sure did it they weren't clear on how long they were gone but uh, but I, I think her performance was was excellent. When you watch this with your kids, did they ask what a payphone was? Brian, I have multiple record players in my house, so <laughs> my kids, my kids. Who's your I didn't have- supporting? Uh, I, well, of course I went with Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, wow. I said it earlier. Wow. So. I think we all believe. I know, I know it's a shocking do. thing. Yeah. Um, I, he, he was probably my first favorite actor in terms of just somebody who I was like, this guy, like the, the, the amount of quality work that he was putting in. Um, I remember seeing doubt. And just being like, geez, like it's like, and it's, it's profound work too. It's really profound work. So I, I, one of my favorites is uh pirate radio. If, if you guys have ever seen it, but, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman is, is really, or was really a special talent. So, um, I gave the nod to him, not just because I truly think he's the best supporting actor, but also because, you know, his talents missed. So, uh, hidden gem, Dustin. This would be Noah Taylor as Dick Roswell, the manager. 
Um, he'd been acting since 87, strangely enough, older than I thought. Um, I think a lot of fans might recognize him as Locke, one of the sort of bad guys in Game of Thrones, but I first noticed him as uh, Walla Darsky in The Life Aquatic. Um, he's kind of one of Wes Anderson's like go-to guys um, whenever there's like a group of people, like he's, he's involved with it. Um, and I, I like him. I've, I, and I, you, he pops up here and there. Um, he, he's not like a leading role guy, but, um, I, I like, I liked his portrayal. Um, the story of like them being childhood friends or something, that's why he's along for the ride. He's not a good manager. I don't know that it, that wasn't super impactful on the movie. I don't think, but I just, I like him. So he's my hidden gem. No, I think he's a great pick. Uh, he's he's one of those guys that shows up in movies, and I'm like, ha ha, yeah, that guy. There you are. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and 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 I've got a couple of those. Like, anytime he shows up in a movie, it's not usually something I end up hating. So he does make good career choices in terms of the movies he uh, blesses with his presence. My hidden gem is uh, Nick Swartzen as the David Bowie fan. Um, he was the guy in the entire movie where out of all of the people I didn't really remember being in this, he hit that bell. I was like, Nick Swartzen's in this? And he's I like, no idea. He's talking trash about something. And then Bowie comes in and he goes, Oh my God, David Bowie. And he starts running after David Bowie. And I was like, that was Nick Swartzen. Is he the face in the camera? Like, like kind of the camera's on his face as he's like arguing with maybe somebody at the front desk and then they show up? Yeah, and, he, and he's got a record in his arm and then Does he have the zigzag, like, uh, like face makeup on or? Cause no, I no, no, it's, it's not no, that. That was a different guy. guy. That was a different, yeah, guy. different guy. But he is, he's, he's talking smack about something at one of the, like, uh, registers for the for the hotel and bowie comes in you see the red hair and he goes he literally stops everything and i feel like he was on some sort of like binge about how people are mega fans and how he hates it and he has right like, literally his voice jumps up three octaves oh, David bowie! and he starts running after it he's actually cast or he's billed as david bowie mega fan recast dustin so um, I felt like uh, the bassist and the drummer could have contributed a little bit more, or maybe it was just um, Jason Lee's role to like represent them in a way. But it's funny that you brought up that thing you do because I actually chose Steve Zahn instead of John Fedovich to play uh, Ed Valencourt. So uh, yeah, that's wild how sometimes our frequencies are on the same level because yeah, I get Steve Zahn in there. Oh, it's going to happen again. Uh, yeah. So I started thinking about people in their 50s, because that would have been, you know, age range for the 2000s for these folks. What if you did, like, Paul Rudd and Jack Black as the other two? <laughs> well, you know what I was thinking or, about this? Or, is- or, or, or even, like, Ewan McGregor. Ewan McGregor hadn't really struck it, like, super hot yet. Like, get, give me a couple faces that are reasonably popular at the time and, and make it fun to like, they did such a good job at tossing people in who like freaks and geeks was obviously something that was going on at the time or, or close to the time. And you had uh, uh, Jay uh, Braschel yeah. in on this as Vic. So I'm just like, okay, so you could toss Paul Rudd in here easily as one of the two. You could. Uh, you know, Jack Black auditioned for Lester Banks. That would have been fun, too. Could have been I, 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 I'm, not, I, I'm not saying that would be better than Philip, but I still would have watched that. Like, that still, that wouldn't have hurt me in any way watching that sort of change. I feel like almost a better question is if this movie was was rebooted and made today, what would the cast look like? Don't I think, ask I that. We have a hundred not have the time. <laughs> no, no, I know we're not going to go into that. But get, It'd be a hundred people that, I've never Jack, heard of. Jack Black would be a no brainer for Lester Bangs if they made the movie today. That's yeah, that's, that's all I was. That's, that's all I was going to say point. about that. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think about in two thousand, but now he would be the no brainer for Lester Bangs. All right, best shot, Dustin. This I agree with whichever one of the two of you said it that it was hard to pick. Um, so I'm just going to go with the, the golden God, uh, roof jumping shot because it was shot from above as he's looking down at the pool with all the people there. Um, and just the, the way that his last words fall flat on those teens, 
before like yeah. I'm on drugs. Uh, <laughs> like, I dig music. <laughs> oh yeah, I right. dig music. I uh, dig music. I'm on drugs. All yeah. Right. Yeah, a couple <laughs> claps. All right, yeah. So like I I just think that was a a good shot. Uh, among like just many many good ones. John. Yeah, my favorite hands down. It's a very simple moment, but when he first gets into the arena um at that um Black Sabbath show. Yeah. Uh, I'm a huge Yes fan. They're playing uh a, a part from I've seen all good people. And it's almost like when he walks in, you, that world just opens up. It's like opening a book. It's like he can just see the world unfold in front of his eyes. Uh my best shot was him standing it's still same arena, but the other side of the door. Him standing in front of that green door with the light shining down. It's completely black behind him. His mom just dropped him off, the super overprotective mom, and he's literally standing at this darkened alley door with one light shining. It was, it was almost exorcist worthy <laughs> in how that looked. And, you know, ringing the doorbell saying, I deserve to come in. Like, I loved that. That I, might seem like a weird moment, but I like that was my favorite shot. Dustin, what's your best scene, man? When uh, when William tells Penny Lane to wake up and not go to New York, uh, they're walking between the tour buses. She is asking about like what Russell said about her. Uh, that's when he, she she keeps saying throughout the movie like. Oh yeah, but the, you know when we get back to the real world, or like like she, it's just really focusing on like her delusion, and William like kind of yells at her like you have to get a grip. You're a space cadet right now. Um, I just I thought that that recognition of uh, it's not just the audience that sees the delusion; it's also a couple of the characters too. So I, I thought that was really important. Absolutely. Um, John, I'd say it's it's kind of a small one, but um, there's so many. Um, I, I kind of like the scene. I like the scene when um, his sister is moving out, and she plays the Simon and Garfunkel song. Uh, great yeah. song choice. Great song choice. And um, you know they're loading up the car, and um, it, it's it's a sweet it's, car. It's, too. it's kind of a cinematic. <laughs> mo- it's kind of a cinematic moment as well. But when she bends in front of the camera to tell him that one day he'll be cool and just the way that shot. Um, so it's kind of a combination of cinema and and dialogue and acting. But that whole that whole scene there of her of her moving out, uh, I thought was a pretty powerful start to the movie. That's cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Good choice. I went with uh, the plane crashing. I, I, that was, I, that was hilarious. I absolutely, I, I love it. Like that, that sort of train wreck is the kind of thing where like, I, I could never, I have a hard time doing awkward. Uh, that's the reason I have such a problem with Ben Siller, but for some reason, just the culmination of all of the baggage that had happened over the course of the movie that culminated in that plane crash, <laughs> including Jimmy Fallon's like, like, I hit a guy in Michigan. Okay, he started just such a <laughs> random thing. And then the pilots coming in and being like, no, we're going to be fine. We're just in the door. Of it. We're all going to die. Like, like <laughs> everything about that scene was funny and honest. And like, this is what these people worry about. Like how, how many artists have died in plane crashes? So it, it, it's that, that whole scene and how he used it was, amazing it's really good yeah in fact that they even they even start like as soon as like the the over the radio it says like yeah we're on the, we caught the edge of an electrical storm like one of the guys goes electrical storm and the other one starts singing like peggy sue it's like oh <laughs> this is like a thing like maybe a superstitious thing like don't do that dude all right best quote Dustin. this is uh a firuza bulk sapphire quote and it's when she's talking to mom you should be really proud of him he respects women and likes women. He's still a virgin. We're all looking out for him. Uh, this is a maid speaking, by the way. Click. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Yeah. John. When they're talking about the article coming out, Russell Hammond says, I never said I was a golden god. Or did I? Or did I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, mine was a Philip Seymour quote. And I, I actually truly believe this. The only true currency in this bankrupt world is what you share with someone when you're uncool. I absolutely 
love that quote. Um, I, I do think that what you share with others in a completely off mic, off kilter world is probably, it's all you got. Yeah. Those phone call, those phone calls give you a lot of cool, uh, like, uh, philosophical, like bases, uh, that he's, uh, he's just so comfortable sharing with this 15 year old kid. Like, uh, that relationship between adult and teenager is as relaxed and cool as it could possibly be shown to be. I think it's, it's interesting when you find kinship that way. Like when you find somebody who, you know, you're like, okay, this, this was me 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, I, I get that. I get that piece. John, Dustin, should we give this movie a rating? We have to rate it. Of course. And yeah. We don't have to. We could, we, we, we could be, you know, we don't have to be a square and we could just, you know, <laughs> we, on a scale of tree to flower, what do you rate this movie, Dustin? Well, I will say I actually rated uh, one of our previous episodes instead of stars. I decided to pick clovers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on a scale of uh, one to five clovers, what are you at? This is a three point five clover uh, movie for me. Uh, I did really enjoy it. I mentioned earlier that I needed to fight through the uh, holier than thou talking about music fan type of uh, attitude slash BS. Uh, there, there's just the the idea. I I wish I sound so like old when I say stuff like this, or I sound like so like not willing to adapt or anything. But like when it comes to like love stories to rock and roll, I like I I just kind of can't stand that at all. Can't you just like music? So a movie like this shouldn't have ever been on my radar. That being said. I really enjoyed it, and I and I was actually watching it again this morning as well. And I was like, "This is fun." I just like the the, the there's so much of a hypocrisy and like just understanding what image is that um like I just I kind of feel like uh, that th- this was never something I was ever gonna like like really really enjoy and so getting three and a half stars out of me is about as good as it can get um i also i I would have preferred it to be darker i also brought this up earlier that everybody has a happy ending here kind of kind of would like it if there was some lingering wounds or something but i don't really want to rain on the parade too much the parade was pretty fun as it was so uh yeah three and a half stars for me Sorry, I, Clovers. I, I, no, it's okay. I, I I don't think I got that from your initial take. I thought you were uh, basically railing against certain people in the movie. So I, I I don't feel this movie exonerated or deified people who put their music on a pedestal. Yeah, in a way, it, it pokes fun at those people. I still okay. had to see them on screen. Okay, gotcha. Okay, I was right? like, I okay. Yeah, it, it, otherwise, otherwise, what I'd be saying is that like I missed the point of the movie, uh, I, which, which is, is possible. But I just like dealing with just the, the, those people at yeah, all, hear even first... in a satirical format, is just like oh yeah. man. But I'm glad I, I made myself put like give forth the effort to fight through that instinct to dis like to dislike it from the jump, and uh, I, I coming along for the plane ride was fun. Excellent, excellent, John. I'd give it a I'd give it a four leaf clover. Um, I think that I think that when uh, you look at uh, you know a film overall, I think it hits on it's pretty much all the marks. You know, it's it's fun, it's touching, it's got great music. Which really, you know, we were talking earlier about the quality of the soundtracks. I mean, soundtrack music in movies has I think come a long way. You know, they used to all be original scores and original music or at least primarily, and now song selection has become so important. It has such a powerful ability to tug on emotions and to become part of the story. Um, And being such a huge music lover, that definitely elevates this movie for me, um, while also having respect for musicians, but also showing, um, you know, where they fall short as well, um, and reminding us that they're still humans, um, 
and that you know none of our heroes are perfect. Um, but you know there are so many great performances. There was the humor. There was the coming of age story. Um, you know there were just some great visual moments. Um, there just there wasn't a whole lot about this movie that um, I think um, strayed far from from the goal of the story, which you know I think ultimately was to tell a story about people coming to terms with life and their dreams uh, and 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 how to grow you know through that process of in this case being in the rock and roll world, which is uh, like the, like the world for all of us is very difficult to. Um, to make it through day by day with all of the things that we face. So uh, I'm going to go with four. Nice. Four leaf clover. Uh, this is going to be one of my, uh, my unicorns. Uh, this is a five star rating for me. Wow. Um, I, I, I love movies about music. Um, I, I actually completely understand your, your thing on, on those types of people. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like this incorporates them and then schmoozes it into the ball of we're not all like them. Yeah. So it's, the, I totally get that uh, as, as a criticism because I, I actually don't like it either because I'm actually more on John's page with this where music is something to be enjoyed. However you take it, how they schmoozed everything in very cohesively with, what is to be distasted? What is to be, you know, not like it doesn't hold anything back. It, it, it ends up being the culmination of what he writes at the end. Like it's an honest piece on music. This is him, them being honest about what this ends up being. And I felt like that was the most important piece. Cool. Movie selection for next time. Option one, Contact, 1997. Dr. Ellie Arroway, after years of searching, finds conclusive radio proof of extraterrestrial intelligence sending plans for a mysterious machine. Option two, 2010, The Year We Make Contact, 1984. A joint U.S.-Soviet expedition is sent to Jupiter to learn exactly what happened to Discovery and its HAL 9000 computer. Or option three, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 1977. Roy Neri, an Indiana electric lineman, finds his quiet and ordinary daily life turned upside down after a close encounter with a UFO, spurring him on an obsessed cross-country quest for answers as a monstrous event approaches. Ooh, option three, Close Encounters. It's going to be good. Well, thank you, John, for coming and being on with us. And thank you to all you lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. We invite you to reach out to us. We want to hear from you. Subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Give us a like on Facebook. Follow us at Twitter at un- movie underscore retro. Email us at retromovieroundtable at yahoo.com. Producing and providing for this podcast is fun but not free. We invite you to support the show at our patreon page www.patreon.com slash retro movie roundtable forward slash any contribution is much appreciated and will go toward making the show better for you the listeners as always we thank you for listening and watch more movies dustin you got guns on us you decide to shoot we're dead up top they got grenades they drop them down here you're dead that's a mexican standoff and that was not the deal